Late breaking news, seven people shot at a bar near downtown. We know two people are dead. San Antonio police say multiple gunshots were fired inside Ventura Bar just after 8 o'clock this evening. The bar is off Avenue B in East Jones. The night team Stephen Cavasso's just heard from Police Chief William McManus, and he joins us live from the scene with the latest. Stephen. Tim Courtney, you can see that there are still several police units out here. Now we're told that this investigation is far from over. Chief Willie McManus does tell us that a concert was taking place at the Ventura Bar when an argument between two people began to take place. Now that argument escalated when one person began to open fire. We're told seven people were shot. We're also told two people died from their injuries. One died inside the club. Now Chief McManus said that they are currently working on putting together a suspect description. I'm confident that we will identify the individual and have that person in custody sooner than later. Now we're told multiple witnesses were that they were speaking with multiple witnesses here on the scene. Some that we talked to said that they are still shaken up by the incident. Now coming up later tonight, we hear from a person that was inside the club who says that he's lucky to be alive. We'll have a story coming up later tonight. Tim, Courtney. Our Stephen Cavazos live for us. New on the night beat, the Texas Anti-Gang Task Force has listed him as an active blood gang member and one of the most wanted gang members in Bear County. Now, 25-year-old Xavier Johnson is in the Bear County Jail arrested on aggravated robbery charges. The Bear County Sheriff's Habitual Offenders Team worked with the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force to arrest Johnson in the 500 block of Sunrise Canyon. They say he and three other suspects robbed two grocery truck drivers. Deputies then discovered Johnson had additional felony warrants. This is the third time Johnson's been arrested in the last eight months. In June, on two counts of robbery, accused of stealing tires from a local shop. Then in October, for allegedly stealing a Converse police car, those charges included aggravated assault against a public servant, theft of a vehicle, evading arrest, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was also arrested for the 2016 murder of Christopher Dotson, but he was acquitted. Also new tonight on the night beat, an Atascosa County jailer has been arrested on felony charges less than two months after she started her job there. 19 year old Madison Howard seen here was taken into custody on suspicion of possession of a prohibited substance in a correctional facility and possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver over four grams. That's according to a Facebook post by Atascosa County Sheriff David Soward. He says deputies found meth in a jail cell a week prior to Howard's arrest. Surveillance images allegedly showed Howard delivering an, delivering an item to an inmate and then taking a payment in return. Investigators also recovered six grams of meth from Howard's purse. She was fired shortly after she was arrested. Another jail-related crime now a Bear County inmate is facing additional charges after allegedly attacking another inmate. BCSO investigators believe Robert Ree attacked that inmate on January 13th, which landed that person in the hospital. Ree was originally arrested on several charges, including assault and evading arrest. BCSO also reports he'd been involved in other violent incidents at the jail prior to this attack. The details of the charges have not been released, and as for that inmate attack, he's in stable condition. San Antonio police say they're still looking for suspects involved in a shooting where a man was shot three times. It all happened around 2.30 this morning at the Shell gas station located off of Calabra Road near Loop 1604. Police say two vehicles pulled up and one of the suspects pulled out a gun and fired several rounds towards the other vehicle, striking one of the passengers. The victim was shot twice in the leg and once in the chest. That victim transported to University Hospital in critical condition. Happening around Texas now, an 18-year-old who was shot at a Dallas high school basketball game has now died. Police say Mark Strickland has been in critical condition since the shooting on January 11th, and he died yesterday. The 15-year-old suspect turned himself in just one day after the shooting. Police are upgrading his charges to murder now. The Dallas Police Department Special Investigative Unit is now leading the shooting investigation. Tomorrow will be dedicated to celebrating the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, and there's a whole bunch of events going on here that we're going to tell you about. They'll start at different times, but all of the events honor King and his fight for justice, peace, and equality. Our Daphne Gray is a preview of what you can expect. 
Martin Luther King needed someone to believe in him. Amen. And even when nobody else could see the vision and he still stepped out on faith. That faith would be celebrated within several events, including this year's 33rd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. March. Before the march, there will be a pre-march early morning worship program, which kicks off at 8. There, the community will enjoy music, dance performances, praise and worship, and remarks from religious and community leaders at the MLK Academy. The big march will kick off at 10 a.m. at the same location and in at Pittman Sullivan Park on Iowa Street. It's one of the largest marches in the nation, stretching nearly three miles down Martin Luther King Drive. Last year, approximately 300,000 people participated. Organizers say they're proud of the young population wanting to be a part of this historic event. We're all equal. We're all one. The justice. These young people now where they had to be silent, they now can open their mouth and speak with confidence. It is something powerful to see. Last but not least, a commemorative program is set to begin around noon. Mayor Ron Nirenberg and other national, state and county officials will be there. People really didn't come together until the influence of this man. I mean, you still had different people that did things, but it took a powerful voice, somebody that was bold, to uh, come and to unite folk, blacks, white, blue, yellow people, uh, whoever, to come and to make change. Now, during the big march, which again kicks off tomorrow morning at 10, there will be road closures. You can find those closures on our website at ksat.com. And of course, as you may know, city offices will also be closed for tomorrow's holiday. Tim, Courtney. Thank you, Jaffney. Well, the fourth annual MLK 5K raised more than $10,000 thanks to around 1,000 people who participated. The race was this morning at Martin Luther King Park. It's an official Dream Week event presented by the Young Men's Leadership Academy. Organizers say they host this event every year so they can continue to spread Martin Luther King Jr.'s message of resilience and equality. We want our young men to stretch themselves beyond um, what's considered the norm. Our goal is that everyone becomes self-aware and happy even beyond college, but we know that that begins now with the support system around them. Young Men's Leadership Academy is the first all-boys public school in San Antonio. The money raised today will go towards school programming. A look outside with live cam tonight. It was a beautiful Sunday. Hope you got to get out and enjoy it. We started off uh, in the low 40s this morning up to near 60 degrees this afternoon and now things are cooling down once again. We're already in the 40s and we'll see morning low temperatures tomorrow in the mid to upper 30s across South Texas. But by 10 o'clock in the morning, if you want to head out to the Martin Luther King Jr. Day March, we'll have temperatures in the mid 40s, cool with low humidity, mostly sunny skies. We'll pick up a few more clouds during the second half of the day tomorrow, but rain chances don't work back into the forecast until late Tuesday. We'll talk all about that and get you a look at your full planning forecast coming up in just a little bit. Tim. We'll look forward to it. Thank you, Katie. The Senate impeachment trial will likely get underway Tuesday afternoon. Over the weekend, a new legal filing revealing how the president's attorneys will likely respond to the articles of impeachment. Here's ABC's David Wright. This weekend, President Trump's lawyers filed their first formal response to the impeachment articles, a six-page letter under the heading Answer of President Donald J. Trump insisting the president did absolutely nothing wrong and calling the Democrats' articles of impeachment constitutionally invalid on their face. Quote, they failed to allege any crime or violation of law whatsoever, let alone high crimes and misdemeanors. Trump defense lawyer Alan Dershowitz claims there's no grounds to remove Trump from office. When you read the text of the Constitution, bribery, um, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, other really means that crimes and misdemeanors must be of akin, akin to uh, treason and bribery. In their written response, House managers take issue with what they call the astounding claim that pressuring Ukraine to interfere in our election is the president's way of fighting corruption. It is not, they insist. Rather, it is corruption itself, naked, unapologetic, and insidious. And the only thing really new about the president's defense is that they're now arguing, I think because they can't contest the facts, that the president cannot be a 
uh, impeached for abusing the power well, of his office. Bit. House impeachment managers filed their own brief Saturday evening outlining their case against the president, arguing the facts are indisputable and the evidence overwhelming. On Monday, the president's lawyers filed their response to the House manager's brief, and then the House managers respond to that by noon on Tuesday. After that, about 1 o'clock Tuesday, the main part of the trial is expected to begin. David Wright, ABC News, West Palm Beach, Florida. Still to come on the night beat, a shooting in an upscale neighborhood in Honolulu today leaves two police officers dead. What led up to the incident and how it all ended with several houses on fire. Plus, Delta Airlines slapped with a lawsuit after a flight dumped jet fuel on a Los Angeles school, dousing several children and adults. And it's not the only fallout from the event. New details coming up. And Harry and Meghan are leaving their royal titles behind, but not before meeting Buckingham Palace halfway. New details on the royal split next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Well, the Queen announcing a deal has been reached with Prince Harry and his wife Meghan to step away from their royal duties. But that doesn't mean the couple got everything they wanted. Here's ABC's Lama Hassan with the details. Queen Elizabeth seen heading to church in Sandringham on Sunday after yesterday's astonishingly personal statement announcing a deal had been reached with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. I mean, this is seismic change for Harry and Meghan and for the royal family. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan stepping back from all royal duties. The decision that I have made for my wife and I to step back is not one I made lightly. And I know I haven't always gotten it right, but as far as this goes, there really was no other option. The Queen saying she recognizes, quote, the challenges they have experienced as a result of the intense scrutiny over the last two years, adding that she supports their wish for a more independent life. But Harry and Meghan didn't get all they wanted, the agreement nixing the idea of them being part-time royals. They will no longer represent Her Majesty, nor will they use their Royal Highness titles, but will still be known as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They will also no longer receive public funds and are free to earn a living. They've made it very clear that they are still going to be thinking of how things will re reflect on the royal family when they make decisions about their new roles. The Queen thanking the couple for their work, saying, quote, Harry, Meghan and Archie will always be much-loved members of my family, adding, I'm particularly proud of how Meghan has so quickly become one of the family. It's clear that it really matters to her that this couple are happy and the future happiness is the most important thing. Palace sources saying the couple plans to spend the majority of their time in North America. The Sussexes have pledged to return the $3 million in public funds spent refurbishing Frogmore Cottage, paying rent for the home now, which they will keep as their UK residence. Lama Hassan, ABC News, London. Ready to read right now over at ksat.com. A new petition is circulating on social media. Oh, imagine that. The goal, <laughs> to do away with Super Bowl Sunday and move it to Saturday. According to the petition on change.org, the creator, Frank Ruggieri of Rochester, New York, says, if the Super Bowl were to move to Saturday, it would get more money and attract visitors to the game. I think they don't have a problem with that right now. <laughs> Ruggieri also believes the NFL will get more eyes on TVs because most government jobs would have the day off and more children would be interested as well. Not mine. The goal of the petition is to gain 5,000 signatures. Again, you can read that right now at ksat.com. We've even included a link to that petition. Never seen a change.org petition do anything. But there you go. Can you stop trying to move holidays? Like, right. yeah. the move Halloween thing. It's a set thing. That's where it stays. I don't know. It doesn't really matter to us. We work both days, so. That's right. <laughs> you can choose to sign it. <laughs> we'll be having our Super Bowl party right here. Right here. Yeah. 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 Meanwhile. Yeah, and the weather. And the weather it's part. finally getting colder after all that humidity that Tim was complaining about. Yes, me complaining never. <laughs> Crazy warm for January, the end of last week. And even Saturday morning, our morning temperatures were in the 60s. That's where our afternoon highs should be. But front came through Saturday morning, and today we were much more seasonable. Morning low is 42. Our average low is 41 degrees. 
High this afternoon, 60 degrees. Our average high is 63. So again, much more seasonable out there today and a lot of sunshine. Hope you were able to enjoy. Things will be staying on the cooler side for the next several days. We've got high temperatures in the 50s uh, all the way through the middle part of the week here. Part of that will be due to increased cloud cover and also chances of rain. Then a little bit of a warming trend later in the week. Right now, plenty cold out there. 47 in San Antonio, 38 in Kerrville. Still in the 50s in Del Rio, 56 and 52 in Carrizo Springs. Very dry air. Our dew points are down a lot. They're in the 20s and 30s behind Saturday morning school front. So have a northerly wind in place. It was definitely breezy yesterday. And even we had a nice breeze about 10 to 15 miles per hour through the afternoon today. But now winds are light just 5 to 10 miles per hour. Even calm winds from Kerrville up to Fredericksburg. Skies mostly clear. I'm going to call it mostly clear overnight tonight. We did have a few clouds starting to sneak in from the northwest and from the southwest as we got closer to sunset this evening. No rain out there though and Again, sky staying mostly clear overnight tonight. Winds light overnight 5 to 10 miles per hour. And here's how your temperatures play out through about dawn tomorrow morning. 38 the morning low here in San Antonio. Low to mid 30s up in the hill country. A low 40s generally south of the Highway 90 corridor. So another cold start to the day tomorrow. Uh, as we head into your Monday afternoon, we'll see high temperatures back in the upper 50s. Uh, mostly sunny skies becoming partly cloudy by the afternoon tomorrow. And you may be tempted tomorrow if you didn't do it today uh, to maybe run your car through the car wash because chances are it was kind of icky after all the high humidity, light rain that we had around late last week. I would think twice though. While tomorrow will be an okay day for a car wash, I definitely wouldn't do it on Tuesday, certainly not on Wednesday because it's late Tuesday into Wednesday that we start to pick back up with chances of rain. And here's why. Things will be pretty quiet next couple of days, but by late Tuesday into Wednesday, our next dip in the jet stream will be moving in from the western United States. This upper level low help to provide a little bit of lift. We'll also see surface moisture rebound by the middle of the week as well. Those two things together uh, will help to give us a nice scattering of rain as we get into Wednesday. Actually, rain chances will start to pick up Tuesday night. Chances for isolated showers moving in from the west late in the day Tuesday. Wednesday, though, looks like our best chance of rain, and that'll definitely be our rainiest day coming up this week. We'll hold on to a chance of showers into Wednesday night before things clear out for us as we get into the day on Thursday. A lot of the rain that starts to kick in late Tuesday into Wednesday will be light, but especially Wednesday even later in the day, um, some rain could be heavy in spots. This should result result in excuse me generally around a quarter to a half inch of rain in and around San Antonio. Some higher totals will be possible east of I-35. That's late Tuesday through early on Thursday. Our next front will move through Thursday to help kind of clear out all the cloud cover and the chances of rain, and that should set us up for a nice end to the week and start to next week. And tomorrow, though, if you're heading out to the march in the morning, definitely have a jacket with you. We'll be in the 40s by mid morning, just shy of 60 degrees in the afternoon. Hey, but no rain out there for the March. That's no, good. Sh should be just fine. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'll be running back to the car. I didn't even bring my jacket inside and I sit next really? to a meteorologist. So <laughs> I'll do the run in heels. You'll see it. It'll be very entertaining. <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, we finally know who will be headed to Super Bowl 54 in Miami with more on what's on tonight's instant replay. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Is there one surprise you at all? No. Okay, there we go. And as far as gets <laughs> Some quick revenge on another beast of the East of Miami Heat coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. San Francisco going to the Super Bowl with a big win tonight over Green Bay. The San Francisco 49ers will be headed to Super Bowl 54 after they were to hold off the Green Bay Packers for the second time this season, but this time for the NFC title. We'll have all the highlights following their showdown in Santa Clara. Second and 10. Another thrilling comeback victory by the Kansas City Chiefs against the surprise team in the NFL playoffs, the Tennessee Titans, and Patrick Mahomes delivers what could be the play of the season to lead the comeback again after last week's 41 unanswered points against the Texans. We'll have all the highlights of the win that sends Kansas City to the Super Bowl for the first time in 50 years. That place is going to be hopping, too. Yeah. DeMar DeRozan was a beast again today, missing a triple-double by one rebound, one assist to lead the Spurs a quick revenge victory over the Miami Heat, the same Heat who beat the Spurs in Miami 106-100 to just last Wednesday. we got the highlights tonight. We'll send you into both the Spurs and the Heat locker rooms tonight should the Astros be stripped of their 2017 World Series title after a Major League Baseball investigation says they cheated stealing signs from opponents. 
Just one of the topics that sports guys will tackle tonight. All that plus one on one with the Golden Boy Oscar De La Hoya. And now that the Spurs are 18 and 23 at the halfway mark of the season, will they make the playoffs or does a streak end at 22 tonight? You decide. Instant replay is live and it's after the night beats. And the rodeo road trip on the horizon. Oh, yeah. And it's a bad one this year. <laughs> oh, good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. We'll see you in just a little bit. Sure. We'll have more on that shooting at that bar downtown right after this. We are continuing to follow that late breaking news we brought you at the beginning of the show. Two people killed and five more hospitalized after shots were fired inside a bar near downtown. The suspect still on the run. The night team Stephen Cavazos is still at the scene over on Avenue B. And Stephen, you've been speaking with witnesses since you arrived there. What are they telling you tonight? Well, Tim Courtney, San Antonio police first say that this investigation is far from over. You can see that there are still several police units out here. And what they've been doing is canvassing the area for shell casings and also taking witnesses in for questioning. Now, a concert was taking place inside the Ventura bar, and it was during that time an argument between two individuals began to take place. Now, things escalated when one person began to open fire. Now, seven people were shot. We're told two people died from their injuries. One was inside the club when they died. Now, one witness we did speak to describes the terrifying moments inside. When we were running, people were just piling on each other, trying to get to that one door. It's a really small environment in there. It's not like a really big bar where there's multiple exits, just two of them in there in the back. The only other exit is where the shots are coming from. So we're all trying to pile through and people were drink, dropping their beers and drinks. So the floor is kind of slippery. So a lot of people were falling. Now, Chief Willie McManus says that they are still working together to put a suspect description together, but they are confident they will find the person responsible. This is still a developing story, so stay with KSAT as we continue to bring you the latest. For now, reporting live downtown, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Tim Court. Thank you, Stephen. We'll see you again in just a bit. A violent rampage in Hawaii has left two officers dead. The suspect set, uh, setting fire to the home he had barricaded himself in. That fire then spreading and destroying several other homes. The suspect now believed to be dead tonight. Here's ABC's Kenneth Moten with the details. Shots fired in Honolulu. Police ambushed while responding to reports of a stabbing. A shooter opening fire with what may have been an AR-15 style rifle. ABC affiliate KITV reports at least three officers were shot. They were doing CPR on uh, the police officer and then there was a loud bang, sounded like a shotgun. Then there was five or six gunshots, sounded like pistol shots. I saw the, the first victim uh, who had been stabbed in the femur, the right femur, um, hauled out by the police. And then um, I then saw uh, two more police uh, uh, bringing out a, a, a third police. The violent encounter triggered as the suspect was reportedly being served an eviction notice. Police say the suspect then stabbed his female landlord and set the home on fire. Those flames quickly spreading out of control to several other houses. Some of those homes now a total loss. The thick smoke visible for miles. The smoke just getting heavier and heavier and thicker and thicker. Hawaii's governor confirmed two officers died, tweeting, as we express our condolences to their families, friends, and colleagues, let us also come together to help and support those who have been forever changed by this tragedy. That third officer injured but alive, and the landlord is reportedly being treated for severe injuries. BI and ATF are now assisting in the investigation after the tragic and deadly day for the Honolulu Police Department. Kenneth Moten, ABC News, New York. Elsewhere around America now, one person has died following a shooting at a nightclub in Memphis, Tennessee. Police there say the shooting happened at around midnight at a club called Truth Night Bar. Four people were injured and some are in critical condition tonight. No suspects have been named and there's also no word on a motive or any arrests. In Port Clinton, Ohio, just west of Cleveland, a group of protesters gathering outside of the home of 14-year-old who recently died. Harley Dilly was missing for weeks before he was found dead in the chimney of a house in his neighborhood. The protesters say they believe police are covering up the truth behind his death. His body was found by officers last week after investigators found his jacket and glasses on the second floor of the house by the chimney flue. The Ottawa County coroner says he died due to compressive asphyxia and that his death was an accident. It is not clear right now why the boy may have tried to enter the home through that chimney. Delta is facing some serious backlash after one of their flights dumped jet fuel over several schools in Los Angeles. The airline has been hit with a lawsuit 
an air pollution violation and a barrage of angry residents concerned about the long term effects. The plane was approaching LAX for an emergency landing when the fuel dump happened. 20 kids and 11 adults were doused on the playground of a school and four teachers just filed a lawsuit against the airline. Delta says there was an engine issue and the fuel dump was normal procedure to reach a safe landing weight. Fuel dumps are usually done from higher altitudes away from people, but Delta said this was an emergency. The FAA is still investigating. In consumer news, a recall alert for you now. Some baby strollers sold on Target and Amazon are being recalled. The company Baby Trend is pulling four mini strollers from its Tango line. Officials with the Consumer Product Safety Commission say the strollers hinge joints can release and collapse under pressure, which poses a falling hazard to children. Baby Trend says people should immediately stop using those strollers and contact them for a full refund or replacement. 47 degrees in San Antonio as we look outside with live cam skies are mostly clear tonight. We've got really dry air in place, light winds that's setting us up for another big cool down overnight tonight. We started off uh, 30s and 40s this morning, but made it up into the upper 50s and low 60s across South Texas. 60 degrees the high in San Antonio today. Our average high this time of year is 63, so very seasonable today. Right now, we're already in the 40s here in town. 40 degrees exactly in Hondo, upper 30s in the Hill Country. It'll be another cold start to the day tomorrow. Rain chances not going to be an issue for any of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day festivities tomorrow, but we will see rain chances pick up by the end of the day Tuesday. We'll talk about that and let you know when you can expect the best chance of showers this week coming up in your full forecast. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Still ahead, it is a record-setting dock diving Labrador who's making waves right here in San Antonio. Jaffe Gray introduces us to Bella and her owner and how they're taking a leap of faith. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Turning to some lighter news now. It is a sport where canines run as fast as they can and dive into a pool of water. And tonight we are showcasing a record holder known as Bella, who, like her owner, is up for the challenge. Share tonight's feature on What's Up South Texas, where we highlight unique individuals in our community. Our Daphne Gray shows us the dynamic duo and where it all began. This is Bella, a two-year-old black lab who happens to be the number one dock diving lab in the nation. She loves the sport. She's a very high drive dog. She's very toy, toy focused. And so we just started going uh, one weekend to the next, entering competitions. Her record jump, 30 feet. Bella's owner, Heidi Patterson, takes her and her sister Tesla to K9 Waterworld for fun and practice. Good girls. They are competitive, um, and Tesla really likes to be in charge, even though Bella's usually in charge. Mm -hmm. Bella's obsession with the water came out of nowhere. In fact, we actually did it on accident. It was a pool party that got the water party started. She was being kind of, you know, annoying puppy, and uh, we just threw a ball randomly, and she ran and jumped and belly flopped into the pool, almost the entire length of the pool and uh, we were shocked. <laughs> Though it looks simple, dock diving is no easy task. She'll jump as far or as high, as hard as she can, but it depends on how I throw it. Mm. So I feel a lot of pressure for her to perform well. It's challenges like these that has made Heidi the hardworking woman she is today. Um, the challenges get bigger and greater, um, but that just means you're working towards something bigger and something greater. So along with the challenges go the rewards. Heidi is a nurse, has a real estate license, and now owns her own CrossFit gym, all of which have one thing in common, her passion for serving others. She lifts everyone around her all the time, including me. Yeah, she's better than I am every day, so she makes me want to be better. I learn from people and I see them grow and change and, and develop and go after what they want in their life and it, it feeds my heart and it makes me happy and it makes me want to work harder. And now she's found a way to get her labs in on the hard working action. <laughs> dive after dive. Heidi and Bella being up for any jump in life is a major splash for What's Up South Texas. It's just taking one step to try something new and explore it. If you like it, roll with it. If you don't like it, try something different.
Now, what's next for them is that they're trying to get Bella ready for the next season, and mm -hmm. they're going to get uh, Bella's sister, Tesla, involved as well, all the while raising awareness about dog sports. But check this out. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get my dog, Bo, <laughs> Try to get him in the game of dock diving. Now, I want him to give Bella a run for her money. Odds are he won't qualify because he's too goofy. Right. But it's a way to work with that energy. I, I absolutely love this family. I was inspired. That's something <laughs> that maybe me and my dog can work on in our backyard. Oh, yes. Because she's already <laughs> into the diving off of the, the diving board. She needs a longer runway like that. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> oh, by the way, K9 Waterworld is in San Marcos. We were out there, and literally it was such a wonderful facility and definitely great where a lot of owners go out there to train mm -hmm. their yeah dogs and again Bella she just she's off the chain they're trying to like I said keep her at the top for this season I could watch that video all day <laughs> of them jumping yeah. yeah so cute. I'm just gonna Very play cool. it on replay for both it's <laughs> like hey here you go we just okay. do it at my house to get the bad out of our dog and then she <laughs> <laughs> yeah it <laughs> works you, on Jeff. that energy <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. It. all right coming up next on the night beat little by little hidden fees can add up to big bucks we'll tell you what to be on the lookout for next time you look at your cable bill All right, when was the last time you looked closely at your cable bill? And really, did you look closely? Because chances are you're paying more than when you signed up for. And that could be because a bunch of little fees add up to big bills. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at what relief is on the way and what you can do to avoid those surprise fees. Cable TV bills, how much is yours? We pay a lot, more than $350 a month. We pay in the area of like $260 now a month for everything. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really bad. I dropped my cable, uh, it became really expensive. Take a close look at your cable bill. You might be surprised to find fees you never heard of. Broadcast TV fee, regional sports fee, set-top box or rental fees, installation, and a lot more. And it all adds up. The average cable subscriber pays nearly $450 in such fees every year. These fees are hidden, consumers are confused by them, and they're really annoyed by them. Most importantly, they're getting worse and they're expensive. One way to cut those fees is to cut the cord. A good quality digital antenna costs about $35 and can tune in local TV stations for free. Streaming services on your smart TV or streaming device typically charge a monthly subscription fee. For example, YouTube TV is $50 a month. That's it. And relief is on the way. Congress recently passed the Television Viewer Protection Act. Number one, it requires cable companies to disclose at the point of sale, meaning right when you're going to sign up for service, of what your total overall price is going to be, including all fees, taxes. Number two, if you don't like the price, you have 24 hours to cancel. And third, they can't charge you rental fees for equipment that you don't even use, like those Wi-Fi routers. The new law is expected to take effect in June. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. And remember, if you cut the cord, you can still watch us online on yeah. ksat.com, or you can stream us on any of those streaming devices on the KSAT TV app. So mm -hmm. pretty cool. A lot of people still do it. ways to watch us. Yeah, a lot of people do it and tune in and say it's, it works great. So Absolutely. Download the app. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think we broke the rule. We're standing out here during this weather segment, and we usually don't. I know. We didn't want to make Katie stand out here on her own. I know. If I'm left by myself, you don't know what I might say. I need you guys to kind of like lead me. I don't know if we're me. the people you want to. <laughs> Look at us now. We're not even talking about weather yet. Weather. Such an. <laughs> there we go. Um, see. Nobody see what yelled I mean? at us today. That's what happened. Um, such a nice, such a nice day today. A lot of sun. Tomorrow is going to be a pleasant day. No rain worries for any of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day festivities. But by late Tuesday, I'll bring a chance of showers back. Check out the temperatures across the country. Yes, it was a cool day here, and it's getting cold out there now. But there is some frigid air up in the central and northern plains. Over in the northeastern United States, they're at 19 degrees in Cleveland right now, just four degrees in Omaha and below zero in parts of North Dakota over on the West Coast, low 60s in Los Angeles, 50s there in Seattle. So a good portion of the country really feeling the chill this weekend. We're in the 30s up in the Hill Country, 46 in Gonzales, 44 up by 35 in New Braunfels. So uh, we've got a nice big spread really between our air temperatures and our dew points. The air is very dry. Our dew points are down in the 20s for most of us. North wind in place becoming very 
very light this evening. Sustained winds just 5 to 10 miles per hour and even a calm wind settling in there up in the hill country. All this along with mostly clear skies will set us up for a pretty cold night tonight. We'll see our temperatures here in San Antonio fall into the upper 30s through first thing tomorrow morning and then we'll climb to just shy of 60 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Mostly sunny through the first part of the day and then you may notice a few more clouds. We'll call it partly cloudy skies rolling in through the second half of the day on Monday. Humidity will be low tomorrow. Winds light out of the east just 5 to 10 miles per hour. You can kind of see on our satellite here we've had some Cloud cover starting to build into the western part of the hill country there. Also some additional clouds working in along the border there and then in deep south Texas. So uh, after a pretty clear day today, there were a few clouds rolling in closer to sunset. We've also got a batch of clouds moving into far north Texas here. And as I mentioned, we'll start to pick up a few more clouds through the course of the day tomorrow. I do think though for the start of the March tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock on the city's east side, still mostly sunny skies, temperatures in the mid 40s. So cool with low humidity, you will want a jacket tomorrow morning. That's for sure into the afternoon. Uh, Sky is starting to become partly cloudy as some more clouds fill in, but we won't see skies become overcast and very gray, likely until closer to the end of the day Tuesday, late Tuesday into early on Wednesday. That's also when we start to pick up better chances of rain. There will be some upper level energy moving in from the West Coast late Tuesday into Wednesday, so we'll start to kick in a chance of rain Tuesday night. So this is 3 a.m. Wednesday morning, so overnight some showers working in from the West. Uh, rain will be around through the day on Wednesday. I do think Wednesday will be our best chance for a lot of us to see uh, some shower activity, maybe a few embedded rumbles of thunder, especially late Wednesday into early Thursday. As this front is approaching, no big concern for severe weather this week, just a few rumbles of thunder possible and also some pockets of heavier rain late Wednesday, early Thursday. As this front approaches from the West, that'll move through on Thursday and kind of clear everything out for us by Thursday afternoon and Friday. So again, a nice day tomorrow, increasing clouds on Tuesday. Tuesday. The cloud cover and the rain keeping our high temperatures on the cool side in the 50s through the middle of the week. And just keep in mind some locally heavy rain will be possible where you see those rain chances there. But a lot of us are looking at some light rain that will probably amount to between a quarter to a half inch of rain. Some higher rainfall totals possible through early Thursday. Well, east of I-35 next weekend looks pretty quiet weather wise with some more clouds around. And I've been informed we did not break any rules. Yeah, so this was meant to be. We're going. supposed to be keeping her company. Yeah. yeah. Tim's so very excited you. about hanging out with you, apparently. Guide me. <laughs> Keep me on track. <laughs> Stay right where you are. <laughs> All right, a debut dominates in its opening weekend. A look at the box office numbers is next. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker fell to fifth place, but $8.4 million gave the blockbuster a domestic total of $494 million. Jumanji The Next Level took fourth place with $9.6 million. It's a $273 million domestic. 1917 fell from first to third, but the Golden Globe and Producers Guild winner made $22.1 million. We've no choice but to embark on this perilous journey. Doolittle managed a second place debut, but its opening weekend gross of $22.5 million was at the low end of expectations. Uh, I'm putting your seatbelt on. Yeah, that's yeah, how we do it now. Right. Bad Boys for Life dominated in its debut. The long awaited action threequel overwhelmed expectations, opening on top with $59.2 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. The Spurs have a tough week coming up that includes two games against the team just in front of them in the Western Conference standings. And they also have to face the Pelicans in New Orleans where the number one draft pick in the NBA is expected to play his first NBA regular season game with Martin Watson Instant Replay. Head over to Greg Simmons. Yeah, let's make it a little bit more difficult, yeah. even though the road's not that difficult, all right? All right. And our Larry Ramirez goes one-on-one -on -one with the golden boy Oscar De La Hoya, who's in town, was in town for the big fight card at the Alamo Dome. Tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. It's time now to refocus our, our time and our, and our energies uh, to bringing big fights to San Antonio. He's one of the most recognizable figures in all of boxing. From his world titles, the Olympic gold medal, Oscar De La Hoya has done it all. Now he's behind some of the biggest boxing matches in the world, including the big fight card that just visited the Alamo Dome. What does he think of the boxing future of San Antonio for more fights? And we catch a special reunion that is 30 years in the making. Larry Ramirez has that for you inside the ring as he goes one-on-one -on -one with Oscar De La Hoya tonight. This process has been one that's been really, really good. We've learned a lot more than we've probably taught him, frankly. Um, 
but he's he's getting to the point where we actually think he's as ready as he believes he is. He hasn't played a single minute in the NBA regular season since New Orleans made him the number one overall draft pick. A knee injury has sidelined Zion Williamson for the first half of the NBA season. But now he's set to make his return against the Spurs this week. We'll get you ready for that game and two against the Phoenix Suns, who are just ahead of the Spurs in the Western Conference standings. And a milestone for the head coach of Reagan High School, our Jessica Hunt, will have that story. All that plus, we'll get you ready for Super Bowl 54 in Miami of all the complete coverage from the Spurs and the Heat. And this player that faces the same team he used to grow up cheering for. Instant Replay is live, and it's next. I'm just excited that there's two new teams playing in the Super exactly. Bowl. Exactly. <laughs> we'll see in just a bit. And we also will have an update right after the break on that shooting at a bar just north of downtown. Here is a quick recap of the breaking news we've been following for you tonight. Two people are dead and five others hospitalized after a shooting inside Ventura Bar around 8 p.m. That's over on Avenue B near downtown. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says a concert was happening when the argument broke out between a group of people inside. He says that's when one person pulled out a gun and started shooting. The 21-year-old man was found dead inside the bar and a second victim died later from critical injuries. McManus also says they're unclear if it was a target targeted shooting and the gunman is still at large. We'll continue following that story for you online and on air. That's all of our time for all of us here at KSAT 12. Thanks for watching. Be sure to tune into GMSA for all of your la latest overnight news. An all new instant replay starts now. I truly don't believe the state of the NBA wouldn't be possible or even be here if it wasn't, you know, for Martin Luther King. Um, to be able to speak the future into existence to what you see now, uh, going in different locker rooms in sports and seeing all type of ethnicities, race, um, genders, everything, um, you know, just the whole equality of life, you know, came from way before a lot of us was even born. Without that seed being planted then, um, I don't think we'll be sitting here in this room today. And we celebrate his legacy tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. We now know who's going to Super Bowl 54 in Miami. It'll be the Kansas City Chiefs against the San Francisco 49ers in two weeks from today to decide who takes home the Lombardi Trophy in Florida. Before that could happen, we had to play Championship Sunday to decide who would represent the AFC and the NFC on game day. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Jimmy Garoppolo and the San Francisco 49ers getting ready to take on Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers in the NFC Championship game at Levi Stadium. Niners strike first, first quarter. Raheem Moster burst into the clear, races in for untouched for the 34-yard touchdown run. San Francisco off and running at 7-0. Early second quarter, they keep going on the ground. This time, Moster takes the delayed handoff, dives over the goal line for the nine-yard touchdown. All San Fran so far, 17-0. Green Bay trying to get back in this game, but turnovers prove costly. On the ensuing drive, Rodgers fumbles a snap. It's recovered by DeForest Buckner. That turns into a Niners field goal, and all of a sudden, it's 20 to nothing, San Francisco. Then, with a minute left before halftime, Rodgers airs it out and is intercepted by Emmanuel Mosley, who returns it back to the 30-yard line. Great field position, and the Niners capitalize on the takeaway again, and guess who? Moster, nice through a gaping hole for the 18-yard score. Three touchdowns for Moster, and San Francisco heads into the locker room looking dominant, up 27-0. Packers not going down without a fight. Opening drive of the second half. Rodgers finds Aaron Jones, races in for the nine-yard score. Packers get on the board, down 27-7. But the Niners answer right back. Ensuing drive, Moster again getting to the edge, and he powers his way into the end zone for the 22-yard touchdown. His fourth touchdown of the day, a conference championship record. Moster finishes with a whopping 220 yards, the most in franchise history. San Francisco racks up 285 yards rushing. On the ground, Jimmy Garoppolo only completed six passes in the game for 77 yards. And Niners are heading back to the Super Bowl. 37 to 20 is the final. Still surreal. Um, you know, I just, I can't believe that I'm in this position right now. And uh, I did the things that I did tonight. And uh, I just, I would like to thank God first and foremost for, for blessing not only myself, but uh, everybody in the organization to be in the position that we're in. It all finally, you know, came to. And, you know, this whole season, uh, ups and downs, we had injuries left and right. We had guys step up when they needed to, from school to Brunskill to our defense, Marcel Greenlaw. I mean, we had guys everywhere stepping up uh, the whole entire season. That's awesome. It's a little raw right now, for sure. But uh, it definitely hurts, I'd say, a little more than early in the career. 
just because you realize just how difficult it is to get to this spot. Now, earlier in the day, the AFC Championship game, Patrick Mahomes firing up the crowd at Arrowhead Stadium as a second-seeded Chiefs host of the six-seeded Titans. And Tennessee comes out swinging, already up 3 to nothing in the first quarter. Derrick Henry takes a direct snap, walks in for the four-yard touchdown. Arrowhead is silent, 10 nothing Titans. Chiefs respond in suing dry. Tyreek Hill on a jet sweep gets the edge and races to the end zone for the eight-yard score. Casey makes it a three-point game. Tennessee answers in a big way, capping a 15-play, 9-minute, 75-yard drive with a one-yard touchdown pass to offensive lineman Dennis Kelly. That's right, at 321 pounds, he's the heaviest player to ever catch a touchdown in the playoffs. Titans stunning the Chiefs. They lead 17-7, but the Chiefs' offense finds their groove. Mahomes with a beautiful pass to Hill. That's a 20-yard touchdown, 17-14. To then under a minute to play, Chiefs on the move again. Mahomes escapes pressure, extends the play towards the near sideline. Then watch this. He tiptoes and stays in bounds somehow, cuts back, fights his way over the goal line, even though they're pawing for the ball for a remarkable 27-yard touchdown run. Mahomes doing it all. And once again, the Chiefs are eight, a double-digit second-quarter deficit to lead at halftime, 21-17. No scoring in the third quarter, so we fast forward to the fourth. That's when Casey pulls away first. Damian Williams gets to the pylon for the three-yard score, 28-17. Then next possession, Mahomes buys some time, steps up, heaves it deep for Sammy Watkins. He has got it for the 60-yard touchdown pass. Adds the exclamation point. The Chiefs go on to win 35-24. They advance the Super Bowl for the first time since 1969, all the way back to Super Bowl IV. I, I knew that I wanted to be in in this moment, being able to play for this game, uh, to get get to the Super Bowl. But I knew it was a day by day process, and I think that's what we preached as a team was uh, we want to be here, we want to be in the Super Bowl, but we have to take advantage of every single day that we get. I said it. I mean, I'm excited for the Hunt family and the players that have worked their tail off. I mean, the coaches. I mean, there's just so much effort that went into this. Coaches that were here before, you know, helped us get to this point. So, and then our fans. I can't wait to get all of them down to Miami, so I hope Miami's ready for that. You don't prepare yourself for this outcome. You know, everything in your preparation, in your mind is, we're going to win this game. You know, you don't really even think of the other side, so when it hits, it hits hard. All right, Super Bowl 54 will be in Miami. And they will take on the 49ers and the Chiefs on Sunday, February the 2nd, two weeks from tonight. So here's a look at comparison stats of the two winning quarterbacks, if you will. Mahomes on the left, Garoppolo on the right here. 615 yards, 208. He didn't have to do much, Dave, because our ground game was so strong. Eight touchdowns total here in the postseason. Uh, uh, fumbles now. They have no interceptions and two fumbles for Mahomes. One only for Garoppolo. That's one interception. The rushing department, Mahomes does it all, too. 106 rushing yards so far in the postseason. One rushing touchdown, none for Garoppolo. Below. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. The Spurs are 18 and 23 at the halfway mark of the regular season. Will they make the playoffs? Yes, and set a new NBA record. No, the 22 season playoff streak ends. Vote through social media. Email us or text us at 210 218 6744. We we'll look forward to your answer and comments tonight. We have much more to come in this edition of Instant Replay. Up next, it's Spurs game day. Kind of a wild possession, but. Um... I mean, that's what Patty does. Plays his heart out there. And, um, I haven't seen Patty really run fast all year, so that was that was that was cool. Our San Antonio Spurs rebound from their disappointing loss to the Atlanta Hawks, the worst team in the Eastern Conference, on Friday to beat one of the best, the Miami Heat. Today, who stood out in the quick revenge game? Larry Ramirez will show you, and Jessica Hunt will take you inside both the Spurs and the Heat locker rooms after the game. Should the Astros be stripped of their 2017 World Series title after a major league? Baseball investigation proves a team cheated by stealing signs from their opponents. What do you think that the criticism leveled to the LSU Tigers for their so-called immature championship celebration? What was Odell Beckham Jr. thinking when he passed out cold, hard cash to college football players following the championship game? The sports guys are back tonight. I just saw him for the first time in years. What a, what a great surprise. And you had a mustache, right? I had a mustache. I had, I had to sport the mustache. <laughs> Looking back at your old pictures may get you off guard sometimes. The Golden Boy, Oscar De La Hoya, got a special visit from his old coach who trained him during the Olympics. It's all part of our exclusive one-on-one -on -one as the Golden Boy tells us his thoughts on the future boxing in San Antonio and who he thinks could be the next big champ from the Alamo City. Meanwhile, Jefferson High School alum Gregory Morales is getting ready to leave for California for his next bout, which can be seen on DAZN this week. The Reagan Rattlers boys basketball team has a lot to celebrate now that their head coach has reached a milestone. Our Jessica Hunt will have more on that. What can the Spurs expect when they face the Suns twice this week starting tomorrow and meet the man from Miami who has a unique name with ties to San Antonio. It's time to know your foe and meet Duncan Robinson when Instant Replay continues live next.